Got a werewolf problem? Well, you've come to the right place. On this episode of Staying Scared. This is not a test. <laughs> Welcome to an eerie and dimly lit place somewhere within the fractured mind of Thomas Scopel. A place filled with dark and sometimes amusing tales of grisly essays, disquieting articles, gruesome reviews, and tingling tidbits. A place where both costume and craft dance the macabre and scary question and scary answer collide. This is a place where each Saturday night at the Shrug of Well, a spookish and rather grim clown steps from the shadows and begins to juggle. This is the Staying Scared Podcast with your host, Wee Willy Wicked. Hi, hi, kitties, and welcome to Staying Scared. I'm your host, Wee Willy Wicked. We'll get to the werewolf thing here in a minute, but I also want to let you know that why it takes a wooden stake to kill a vampire. We have our second in our interview with the monster series. This time it's Dracula. I'm going to tell you about some serial killers that have 13 letters in their name. And we have a couple little usual tidbits. All brought to you by our sponsor, Ghoul Insurance. We take the terror from you. Has your glasses been broken during a scuffle with the boogeyman? Was you forced to abandon your favorite pair of heels? Fleeing a fiend? Was your car window smashed by a monstrosity? Or has it been wrecked while fleeing a flesh eater? Maybe your home has been ransacked by a band of predacious marauders. Or your favorite pickup truck was destroyed by a pair of unwanted. Since 1968, Ghoul Insurance has covered these and much more. Because Ghoul Insurance is your one-stop shop for the horrors of life. Ghoul Insurance, we take the terror from you. In film and book media, werewolves, with the exception of Teen Wolf and a choice few others, are typically, and rightly so, portrayed as something vicious and horrible, employing superhuman strength, razor-sharp teeth and claws, and an aggressive disposition. They are stealth, fast, and can strike without notice. With exceptional hearing and smelling senses, no hiding spot is safe. Killing these terrible beasts can be most trying. The standard weapons simply don't apply, and since they heal basically instantaneous, most efforts are in vain. But fear not, fellow ghouls, all hope is not lost. There is a solution, and it's called Silver. The first reputed werewolf was in 1591 in Bedburg in Cologne, Germany. His name was Peter Stubb. And the legend tells of sorcery, evil packs, brutal acts, and his eventual execution. Depending upon location and belief, primarily European originated, there are various ways to become a werewolf. With the aid of modern horror media, many are familiar with the most common way, through the bite. However, there are other less common ways. The earliest belief was by making a pact with the devil in order to fulfill a desire craving for human flesh. Supposedly, the devil offered the ability to metamorphosize in exchange for the soul. Being cursed is probably the second most common method. Now, this curse can be either human or God-related. However, when it is God-related, it is a punishment for invoking their wrath. In Greek mythology, 
The werewolf originates when King Lycan attempts to feed and poison Zeus with human flesh. Zeus isn't fooled and condemns Lycan to a life as a wolf, thus the Lycan word origin. Other ways of infection are by drinking the puddle of rainwater lying in a werewolf's paw print, wearing a wolf skin belt while nude, and sleeping outdoors with the moon directly hitting a person's face on certain Wednesdays and Fridays. Is there a cure? There are three reputed methods for curing werewolfism. Using wolfsbane medicinally, surgical removal, which usually kills the person, and or exorcism. In a 1963 study by Dr. Lee Ills entitled A Propheria and Aetonology of Werewolves, he argues that the medical condition of rabies could very well be the actual origin of the werewolf legend, since the historical symptoms are uncannily similar. And since rabies is a contagious disease, it could explain why being bitten by the afflicted would infect to create a new werewolf. Other medical conditions have been debated in an attempt to explain also. Where hypertrichosis deals primarily with excessive hair growth, prophoria is much worse. In a nutshell, results are red blood cell pigment loss and becoming painfully photosensitive. In the latter stages, thick hair growth sores, skin, and cartilage change, and nails and teeth become reddish. Usually there are varying degrees of mental illness also prevalent. Is simply killing this menacing beast enough? Similar to a vampire, it is believed that if the werewolf's head is not separated from the body, they will rise to hunt again. A removed head tossed into a brook is thought to sink and remain under the surface, held down by the weight of its sins. Why does it take shape only during a full moon? Well, Leone Calver, a clinical research toxology nurse at Calvary Mater Newcastle Hospital in Sydney, Australia, has researched this phenomenon, and in her medical journal of Australia documented the study. She cites, our findings support the premise that individuals with violent and acute behavioral disturbances are more likely to present to the emergency department during the full moon. There is a theory that may lend some credence to the full moon conception. Now the moon controls the tide through lunar gravitational pull, and since the human brain is primarily made up of water, the full moon may have an adverse effect on this water also. Additionally, this may cause ill feelings to come forth and surface, creating the transformation much like the proverbial lunatic. The silver aspect made its way into the lore in 19th century, when it was reputed that a silver bullet was used to kill the beast of Gavadian. This was the name given to a toothy, red-haired, and smelly, man-eating wolf-like animal that roamed France's south-central Margerade Mountains between 1764 and 1767. As for silver, it is reputed to have associations with both the human soul as well as the moon. And it is this metal that has been long considered to have mystical properties. These properties act much like the werewolf's natural ability to wolfsbane and burns from the inside. Why, even the Bible in Psalms 12.6 addresses this. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver tried in of earth, purified seven times. This purification and absolute is an aspect that, being pure, Satan cannot twist and with a werewolf being reputed to have originally made a pact with the Dark Lord to become impervious to man-made weapons, an absolute purifier was needed. In its pure form, silver has both the highest electrical and thermal conductivity of all metals, 
and thus combined with the divine properties as well is well suited for disposing of a werewolf and so fellow creepsters got that werewolf problem well maybe we've helped forget about the normal weapons though and think outside the box get you some silver it's the only solution <laughs> Night of the Living Dead has received many accolades. Entertainment Weekly ranks it as the 13th scariest movie of all time, and Bravo ranked it at number 9 on its 2004 100 Scariest Movie Moments special. It is spying number 909 of the Criterion Collection, and listed among the 1001 movies you must see before you die. In 1998, it was one of 400 movies nominated as one of the top 100 greatest American movies by the American Film Institute, and also by the American Film Institute. It made the 2001 list of top 100 most heart-pounding American movies. And, in 2011, it was inducted into the Horror Host Hall of Fame as the most hosted film in history. They're coming to get you, Barbara. And I always wondered why it took a wooden stake to kill a vampire. Well, I did some research on this, and I come to learn quite a bit also. For instance, I learned that vampires have supposedly been around since the dawn of time. And so I started thinking, well, there were people who fought those vampires, and in the dawn of time, there was no weapons other than rocks or sticks, maybe. So maybe they grabbed sticks and they stuck them with those. So maybe that's where the wooden started one. Uh, uh, uh. Then there's the tale of Vlad the Impaler, who impaled his enemies on stakes around his, the perimeter of his country in order to scare off any potential invaders. Bram Stoker had been familiar with, with Vlad the Impaler and was, uh, it's absolutely certain that uh, he was an influence on his classic masterpiece Dracula. So since the stakes were wood, that might have something to do with it. Uh, uh, uh. And then there's Hollywood. Whether it was Christopher Lee, Bella Lugosi, or a host of others, it seemed that the blood-sucking, cape-wearing, fang-dangling beast died at the hands of a wooden stake. But no one had ever answered it. Well, delving deeper, it's because wood at one time was alive as opposed to, say, steel or plastic or any other manufactured material. And it's that ability or that it, the fact that it had been alive at one time, that it's able to suck up a vampire's life. Fruit trees are especially susceptible to this. Since they have given of themselves, they have given fruit, and they have produced, so they can suck up even more life. So in a nutshell, the reason it takes a wooden stake to kill a vampire is because wood at one point was alive, and it maintains that ability to suck up the the undead. Only 52 days until Halloween. Well, 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 kiddies. Uh, Tracking Dracula down was a tough and rather fearful adventure. But with the aid of a few 
from his side of the family it occurred. But it was only because my surname wasn't Van Helsing. After an exhausting search consisting of friends of friends, each subsequent connection growing more and more gothic, I managed to track down someone close enough. She too had pointed fangs and a perpetual look of hunger, making me almost certain of ending up a few quarts short. Through a confident but fast hissy voice, she promised to deliver my request to the Count and returned with a reply by Friday. And it was during the small hours when I, when I woke to them famished eyes leering down at me. She handed me a rolled up parchment tied with a red ribbon and went back to the open window, disappearing into the night. My inquiry was really nothing more than your basic and average everyday request for a personal interview, including a location and time. The location was at the end of an extended wooden pier, bench seats allowing south, west, and north views. After midnight, the place slows, grows quiet. Maybe hand-in-hand -hand lovers or a wino tilting a bottle of ripple inside a stained paper brown bag. Surrounded by water and unsure of the Hollywood cliché of vampires having a fear of water held any truth, after realizing the bench was a mere few feet from the pier's edge and a short drop to the choppy surf below, I somewhat relaxed. His reply, personally written in wonderfully detailed and painstakingly meticulous Old English lettering, accepting both location and time, was cordial. A couple days prior to the meeting, apprehension started to grip, and thoughts of garlic necklaces, crosses, and wooden stakes increased. The day before, I decided to wear a cross necklace on a short chain. That always worked, at least in the movies. The night came and was overcast, darker than usual, with all but a petite portion of the full moon passing through. I was early, claiming a bench, and in the damp stillness watched a mist roll over gently crashing waves. Tonight there would be no lovers, fishermen, or drunks. No mingling, and I felt alone. Vulnerable. Somewhat jerky, I peered back and forth, eyes ever hunting for his approach. Hazy and hidden, with three tiny rays of moonlight poking through. For a moment, I looked up, and upon lowering, he was sitting alongside. I jumped and slid backwards, and he grinned. Obviously far quicker than given credit, that notion of illusion by water suddenly seemed all for naught. Maintaining the grin, our eyes met, and his flashed red before going normal. I wondered if the fangs were digging into his lower lip. Good evening. His accent was thick and heavy, pretty much depicted accurately in films, and hearing the voice for the first time shot shivers, forcing me to freeze. Contrary, there was no black cape either. Allow me to put you at ease. You will not be left in the Treasure That would deprive the world of our conversation. Frankly, originally reading your request, 
I view you as another chest, a treasure, concocted by an enhancing ancestor. A ploy to bring me into the open. But Lacey was adamant. A sure, a sure serious, serious intent. intent. Oddly, fear began to fade, and I started thinking this wasn't such a bad idea after all, especially since the undead legend seemed, seemed acutely aware and obviously intelligent. Well, Mr. Count, call me Judah. All right, Dracula. How accurate would you say the film accounts are? For the largest part, most, most come quite close in fact of, fact of subsisting on blood, but rarely is a neck ripped, shred, or torn. Too much loss and waste. Leave that to the werewolves. As far as the rest, you certainly can't expect me to broadcast my weaknesses. But I will humor you. Say that Hollywood only has part right. As far as those leaves the ghosts, you fellows, are concerned, Lee's eyes come close, while the gothic the ghosts appearance is more appropriate. Since you've mentioned werewolves, is there actually a feud? Ah, the werewolves. They have been around almost as long as we vampires have. But most, but most view them as despicable, a scourge of the underworld. It's their vicious disposition. Sometimes they kill, simply for the sake of pity. We tend to avoid one another. But much like, like a fable, gunfighter, gun perceiving invincibility, and entering a town seeking the fastest draw. On, a, on occasion, one tends to overstep bounds, and a fight ensues. Someone dies. This causes cause vendettas, vendettas, not fears. I often wondered about mirrors. Is it true that you cast no reflection? Yes. Viewing ourselves will prove damaging. One of those things Hollywood doesn't address. And neither will I. Don't ask. For security reasons, I won't inquire as to your physical residence, but would really like to know whether or not a coffin is involved. The coffin, eh, that, that too is a Hollywood misconception, but one I comprehend from the story. Death to you humans is the most terrifying prospect. With the intent to scare, also associated with death, the coffin was added by the entertainment industry to reinforce terror. The truth is, I used to be content at the castle, but the place has become too well known, and now I move incessantly. Have become, have become quite, quite content, content most, most anywhere. anywhere. A, cave a cave or mine, an old, an old deserted, deserted house, house. Plenty, plenty of damp basements. I've, I've rested, rested in them all. all. Can you fly without turning into a bat first? The bat, the bat. Something, something else, else added later. later. 
The short, the short answer, answer is, is yes. 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 Could reach could over, over, snatch and take it. He looked ahead and maintaining a seated position, floated up off the bench a couple feet, hovering for a few moments before coming back down. Has human blood always been the penchants? No, no. but, but while a small animal was nourished, nourished. The nag for more, more and more forces reoccurring honey chronically lingers. Deer taste like a blend of stale nature, while not beyond snatching a doe from time to time, human fulfills immediate, a sweet curse. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have considered whether or not his evening meal had been completed before asking this question, and I wondered whether his need for blood was comparable to that of an alcoholic needing a drink or a drug addict needing a fix. His eyes reddened, shattering all reassurances, and suspecting being viewed like a meal soon enough, I cut the interview short, using the unforgiving editor excuse. Walking away, my pace quickened. There was an undeniable feeling of being swooped down upon. I glanced back at the bench. He was gone. On the way home, although conscious of staying under streetlights, I still repeatedly glanced up from time to time. Later on that evening, leaning back, the piece written, I rubbed the silver cross necklace around my neck and wondered if it was sterling. If so, the easy part will be done. Now to find a werewolf. Night of the Living Dead has ended. Dawn of the Dead is... You know, Dawn of the Dead is an absolute classic zombie horror film, which ranks at the top of most lists and also has a 93% approval rating at Rotten Tomatoes. Romero made this in 1978. He was invited to the Monroeville Mall, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. He was invited there by a friend. And... His friend took him back behind the scenes and showed him everything and said, no matter what kind of catastrophe we have here, uh, anybody could survive at a mall. Well, that gave Romero the idea and he went home and he started writing the Dawn of the Dead screenplay. Now there's a couple tidbits about this film. There's an alternate ending, which Fran and Peter, Fran walks into the rotary blades of the helicopter, and these are both suicides, and Peter shoots himself. But she walks into the rotary blades just like the zombie did at the beginning of the film. Now, the prosthetic headpiece that they had, they used for blowing up a head in the beginning of the film also, because they still had that. She was supposed to wear it for uh, for the special effects for the helicopter, and didn't. And uh, uh, so they used it at the beginning of the film with the shotgun blast, the infamous shotgun blast. Well, the alternate ending is supposed to show the helicopter rotary blades slowing down as the, as the motor's sputtering, and they're going down. That's why the suicide, because no matter where you went, it was always going to get worse. When there is no more room... Now, the reason I'm bringing all this up and speaking about the Dawn of the Dead is because yours truly has a collectible that was shown in the film. This is a piece of the escalator from the Monroeville Mall. They were tearing it down, and they were funding the Living Dead Museum, 
So they were selling a piece of this for basically $20. They still have some for sale, so go to livingdeadmuseum.com and hunt it down. They have some rocks from uh, the Day of the Dead uh, mine that they filmed at, and there's a few other things. A lot is sold out, but get on it while you can. Own a piece of history from the 1978 classic George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, a piece of the escalator from the Monroeville Mall where it was filmed. Well, 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 kiddies. Now, I told you I was going to tell you about some serial killers that had 13 letters in their name. This is quite uncanny. Let's start with Jeffrey Dahmer. J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-D-A- H M E R 13 letters. Did you know that he had what he liked to call a hobby, I suppose? He would kill small animals and uh, scrape the meat off the bones and display the skeletons. He also did that with one of his victims. Just a side note. John Wayne Gacy J-O-H-N-W-A-Y-N-E G-A-C-Y Now this guy was a sexual deviant. I'm not going to go into details because they are just entirely way too graphic. Even for staying scared, we will not cross that line. But he was also a clown. Now some of his clown paintings, uh, they go for a lot of money and I disagree with that. There's no way, shape, or form that this, uh, there should there should be profit involved here but that doesn't mean I wouldn't covet owning one of them why I don't know it's a demented thing I'm wee willy wicked and I like those kinds of things but I won't pay for it he was executed his final words were kiss my ass now there's plenty of stories about Theodore Bundy T-H-E-O-D-O-R-E-B-U-N-D-Y 13 letters There's lots of stories about him The one I like the most Is on the day that he was fried in the chair the radio, local radio station played a uh, background of frying bacon, and they all sang on top of old Sparky, all loaded with juice. Goodbye to old Bundy, no more on the loose. And I'd have to say that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Now, Jack the Ripper uh, maybe technically doesn't fit into the 13 letters, but J-A-C-K-T-H-E-R-I-P-P-E-R. -E Everybody knows who Jack the Ripper was. They don't know who he is but they know who he was. Ed, he was the terror of London. 13 letters in his name also.
And then we come to probably the most notorious mass murderer of all time. Charles Manson. C-H-A-R-L-E-S M-A-N-S-O-N For serial killers to have 13 letters in their name. That is rather uncanny. You know, 13 is supposed to be a bad number. Here's a couple other number 13 tidbits. Did you know that there are 13 turns in a hangman's noose? Did you know that there are 13 steps up to the scaffold? <laughs> Creepy numbers. And there you have it, kiddies. Episode 2 of Staying Scared. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Contact us at stayingscaredpodcast at mail.com. If you want to talk to just me, we Willie Wicked, then send it to me, we Willie Wicked at mail.com. Next time, I'm going to tell you the true stories of Sleeping Beauty and Snow White. We're going to have our third in our interview with the Monster series, The Werewolf File. We have a chilling little ditty that just might make you think, entitled, While You Sleep. And I'm going to talk about some of the good old days. They weren't really all that good. This is Wee Willie Wicked saying, stalk us. <laughs> Stay scared. Stay scared.